Amen. So be it. Who here likes golf? Anybody got golfers around here today? Okay. I actually, I actually love golf. This is an actual golf course in California. It's not Pebble Beach. You might think it is. I don't remember where it is, but it's an actual golf course in California. I actually love golf, but I haven't played a, a round of I made sure this was connected real strong before I did that. Um, I've not played a round of, of golf for probably 20 years because I'm absolutely awful at golf. Like, I am terrible at, at golf. I do love top golf, though. If you've not tried it, you should. And I love top golf because you can score by accident, right? Like, a few weeks ago, I beat my entire family at a game of top golf. By accident, I won the game. Like you, you can aim at one target and land at another, and you still get points. It's a great way to play, to play golf. But you know, I, I gave up golf because I, I'm terrible at it. And just the truth is, when I was out playing you know, golf, I struggled to act like a pastor. And oftentimes, struggled to act like a Christian. And some of you are in the same boat and might need to do, do some work with Jesus today, but I digress. If, if, you're, if you're out on the, on the fairway, on the course, and you're, and you're playing golf, and you're struggling with your, with your swing... Like, if, if the greatest golfer of all time, in my opinion, Tiger Woods, and it was great to see him on the course again this last weekend in the, in the tournament that's being played. Uh, if the greatest golfer of all time, Tiger Woods, came up and said, hey, swing like this, you're probably going to listen, right? Or, or maybe let's take basketball. Uh, basketball was, was my sport of choice when I was, was growing up. Um, Let's say you're out playing basketball. Don't worry, I won't shoot it towards the actual screen. Um, you're out playing basketball, and you're taking your game pretty serious. Maybe you're in a league of some kind, but you're struggling with your shot. If, if the greatest shooter of all time, not the greatest player of all time, greatest player of all time without debate is Michael Jordan, okay? Yep, okay? So not the not, not greatest player. If the greatest shooter of all time, and this is up for debate, but in my opinion is Steph Curry, greatest shooter, if he came up and said, hey, shoot like this, you're probably going to listen, right? So if you're wanting to grow in your prayer life, who are you going to listen to? It's not a trick question, by the way. We're in church, so the answer to questions is almost always Jesus or yes. Just be careful when you say it out loud. You know, you don't want the pastor to say, who's our enemy? Jesus. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. You know, so it's almost always Jesus or yes are answers to questions. So if you're going to try to grow in your prayer life, who should we listen to? Jesus. Yes, it's still not a trick question. It's still Jesus. <laughs> Jesus, the greatest of all time. Now, I'm fully aware, I'm certain, there are some people here that you're not real interested in growing your prayer life. And there might be a number of different reasons for that. Maybe you, you're not interested because God did not answer a prayer or many prayers that you prayed to him. Or maybe you were given just, you know, bad expectations or bad applications to prayer and so you've just grown really frustrated with it or feel like, man, I just can't figure it out. And so you're just, and it's like, I'm just not interested in growing in my prayer life. Or maybe you're not interested because you don't believe in God. You've not put your faith in God through Jesus, surrendering your, your life to him. Whether you do or don't want to grow in your prayer life, whether you believe in Jesus or not, um, all are welcome at the table here at the harbor. And my hope and prayer is that through this sermon today and then through our series over the next seven weeks called Pray Like This, my hope is that all of us, me included, would take one more step in our understanding and in our practice of prayer. One of our core values here at our church is prayer is our priority. And so if prayer is going to be a priority in my life and our church's life, we've got to have some like, common understandings at least around prayer. In the book of Matthew, in the New Testament portion of the Bible, written by Matthew, one of the 12 disciples of Jesus, he records Jesus giving what we call the Sermon on the Mount. It's the longest recorded sermon uh, from Jesus in Scripture. And right in the middle of the sermon, he starts teaching on prayer. And we're picking up Matthew 6, 7 through 9. Jesus says this, when you pray... It's actually the third time now he said when you pray. So not if you pray, but when you pray, 
Don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them. For your father knows exactly what you need even before you ask him. And then he says the next three words, which is the title of our sermon series. Pray like this. And the words that follow are what we have come to know of as the Lord's Prayer. And we need to understand right from the jump here that the Lord's Prayer was not given by Jesus as a mandate for how we should pray, like using these exact words only. So it's not a mandate of like literally pray this. It's okay to pray that prayer, but that's not how we should always pray. It's, it's a model of what our prayer should look like. Dr. Tony Evans, pastor up in the Dallas area, said this, Jesus wasn't giving them a prayer to repeat, but guidelines to provide prayer categories, a prayer template, if you will. And that's how we're viewing it in this in the series. Prayer, by the way, is also not a way for us to get God to do whatever we think he should do. In fact, the meaning of the word prayer in the New Testament, I think, gives us a, a much different understanding of prayer than, than maybe we've had before or maybe in a way that we use. Uh, the word prayer in the New Testament comes from the Greek word prosukamahi. I have no idea if that's how you say it, but if you say it with confidence, nobody questions you, so just that's a lesson right there. Like come across weird names in scripture, just make something up. People are like, oh, that must be how you say it. And you could have no idea, just say it with confidence. I have no idea how you say it. I just know that's the Greek word. I am not a Greek scholar at all. The point's not the word, it's the meaning. And the meaning of the word is this. To exchange wishes, literally to interact with the Lord by switching human wishes or ideas for his wishes as he gives us faith. Wow. Wow. To exchange my wishes for his and then receive the faith from him to accept it. That's really what prayer is. So when we say prayer is a conversation, that is true. It's not a monologue to God. It's a dialogue <laughs> that I express my wishes, but I receive his back as well. It's not about telling God my desires and then him fulfilling them like he's some cosmic vending machine, right? Right? No, prayer is telling God my desires, which we should. We are encouraged, we're invited to tell God our desires, but then it's also waiting on him and trusting him to exchange those wishes of mine for his, which are often in the form of him answering what we prayed for, but not always. He doesn't always do that. That's why we've got to start our prayers with the first principle Jesus gives us in the prayer, and it's the principle of position. In fact, here's our big idea for today. The position of our prayers are more significant than the practice of our prayers. The position or positions of our prayers are more significant than the practice of our prayers. It's not about what we say or how much we say. It really is more about who God is in relationship to me. The position relationally that I'm praying from. Which leads to our big question today. What positions matter most in our prayers? What positions matter in our prayers? The main scripture is literally just the next section of the Lord's Prayer. We're going to look at four words in Matthew chapter 6, second part of verse 9. This is what's going to take us seven weeks to do this, okay? Uh, we will be looking at some other scriptures and quotes today, which will be on the screen, or you can follow along in the Harbor app as well. We've already read Jesus telling us, when you pray, don't feel like you gotta use a bunch of different words or even fancy words to impress me. Just pray like this. And then we have the next four words of what Jesus said, Matthew 6, second part of verse nine. Our Father in heaven. Our Father in heaven. Four words that reveal, at least I think, to me, the positions that matter in my prayers. And again, I'm not talking about like physical positions of the body, kneeling, sitting, standing, lifting up hands. Those are all appropriate things in prayer that we can and, and should do. That's not what we're talking about here. Uh, we're, we're again talking about a, a relational position that matters. 
it sets the tone, this position sets the tone for the rest of our prayer life, including the rest of the Lord's Prayer. And the first position I want us to see is this, a position of adoption. A position of adoption. Jesus starts the prayer with two words, our Father, informing us that, that we come to God from a position of adoption. That, that by faith in Jesus, I am a child of God. That God, through the Apostle Paul in Romans 8, verse 15, says this, So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. Everyone help me out and just say Abba. The term Abba, many of you might be familiar with this, but the term Abba is from the Aramaic language. Um, so it's different than the Greek that the New Testament was written in. Aramaic was the language most commonly used by Jewish people in the days of Jesus. Uh, it's a title, Abba is a title not just of biology or legality, like this is my dad. It's a title of intimacy, a term of endearment that was only used by a child or a, a, you know, a, a son or a daughter who was loved, known, cared for, accepted, provided for, and nurtured. It signifies an affectionate and a dependent relationship with their father, Abba. And I know that word father and associating it with God, our heavenly father, can be triggering and very difficult for people. Because the sad reality is there are some people who had or do have horrible dads who did awful things in their life. Or maybe your dad wasn't even around. He was absent. Or maybe he was present in the home but just absent as a father. And so for some people, the thought of God as a father is so hard to receive when it's seen through the lens of our earthly dads. And if that's you, like, man, we acknowledge that. We, we see that as a legitimate struggle for you. And please hear me, we see you. We see you in that. And you might need the help of a trusted Christian friend or leader or mentor or small group, or a pastor, or maybe even a professional counselor to help navigate some of those past traumas and pain in your life and how they are still maybe affecting you today. And we are, are for all, any and all of those things and have resources to help. If, if you need help finding uh, you know, someone to help navigate you through those things. But, but on the flip side, even for those who had great dads, like every single person at some point, because we live in a broken, fallen world, everyone experiences wounds or scars from our earthly fathers. Like even the best dads are not perfect. And the devil is great at twisting even the efforts of the best dads to form lies in us about who we believe our heavenly father is as well and who we believe we are in his presence. That's why I love what Pastor Louis Giglio said. He said this, God is not a bigger version of your earthly dad. He's not a reflection of your earthly dad. He is the perfection of your earthly dad. He's everything you ever dreamed your earthly dad would be and more. So if you've had a great earthly dad, that's amazing. We celebrate him, but God is exponentially greater. And if you had no earthly dad, then the heavenly father wants to teach you what it is to have the blessing of a good father on your life. Is that good? Tyler Staten, who wrote the book Pray Like Monks, Live Like Saints, which I highly recommend, I read it in preparation for this series. In the book, he said this, Catholics simply call this prayer the Our Father. I wonder if they're onto something. Every line of the play, prayer flows from those two words. It all starts and ends with remembering who we're talking to. 
And this is something that I've struggled with for a long time in my life. I had a great dad, like a great dad, still do. He wasn't perfect, and he'd be the first one to admit that, but I would have no problem using the term and the meaning of the word Abba to describe my dad. Yet even as a pastor in the ministry who grew up with a great, loving dad, I struggled in my prayers and in my spiritual walk to view myself as a loved and accepted son of my heavenly father. And it was only through hours of counseling and working with other spiritual leaders in my life, having the help of someone to guide me through the lies I was believing that my view of God and my view of my relationship with God began to change. I still, today, struggle at times to hold on to the truth of who God is and who I am in Christ before the Father. It's hard not to go back to those lies that the enemy has convinced us to believe. That's why I have to constantly remind myself of what's true. And one of the ways that I do that is by speaking God's truth over specific areas of my life that I continue to struggle with. One of those truths that's been so helpful for me, and maybe it will for someone in the room as well, is this, it's on the screen. I say this often in my life. I come to and speak to my good heavenly father as a loved, forgiven, redeemed, accepted, and reconciled son through Jesus Christ. He sees all of me, forgives anything in me, sanctifies every part of me, and has already experienced the deepest and darkest places of my soul through the continual pleadings, prayers, and intercession of the Holy Spirit and of Christ. Therefore, I share all in full confidence that he wants to hear what he already sees. That's one of dozens of truths I have, all of them rooted in scripture that help me keep the position of my prayers and my relationship with God in a healthy place. Well-known author and theologian A.W. Tozer said this, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. So it might mean we ask this question. Are there any lies I'm believing about God or myself that are hindering my relationship with him or my prayers to him? You should ask yourself that question. Are there any lies I'm believing? And again, you might need the help of someone who's gone before you in your spiritual walk to help guide you through those lies and how they're affecting you today. The position of our prayers are more significant than the practice of our prayers. So what positions matter in our prayers? Well, the position of adoption. We are loved and accepted children of Abba Father through Jesus Christ. He is for us and not against us. He loves us unconditionally and without question. Second position is this, a position of authority. A position of authority. Not my authority, by the way but his. The next phrase Jesus gave in the prayer is in heaven. Our Father in heaven. That yes, he is a loving, gracious, merciful, kind, compassionate Father, but he sits in a position of authority in heaven. He is Abba, Father, intimate. But as Abba, he holds authority over heaven and over earth. He is wholly other. He is separate, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion. Scripture tells us that it is impossible for us to understand his ways and his decisions. We are told that no one knows enough to give God advice, yet we try. It says, who has given God so much that he needs to pay them back? Romans eleven thirty six 36 says, for everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory. All glory to him forever, amen. So be it. 
Psalm 89, 7, the highest angelic powers stand in awe of God. He is far more awesome than all who surround his throne. First Chronicles 29, 11, yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. Everything in the heavens and on earth is yours, O Lord, and this is your kingdom. We adore you as the one who is over all things. Like, come on. I could go on and on and on with reference after reference in Scripture of the greatness, the majesty, the power, the authority of who our God is. We, we sang it in the song called Authority, one word from you. And things change on your authority that you are the king of kings over everything. He has authority in this place. And this is where the title Abba goes one step further. Because while we most often refer to Abba as a term of intimacy, which it is. It is also a term of authority, one of submission and surrender. Like they go together. I mean, if there was a God, a Father who is as holy and mighty and majestic and powerful and, and sovereign and in control as Scripture says our God is, if he is those things, you have to have the intimacy part or you'd never trust him. Like if God were all powerful but not intimate and kind, I don't want anything to do with that God. So, so we need both together, but because he is Abba, because he's intimate and merciful and kind, we can surrender to and trust his authority in our life. It's intimacy and surrender. Intimacy and obedience because I trust him. I trust his authority. That's why Jesus told us in Luke 17, verse 10, in the same way, when you obey me, you should say, we are unworthy servants who have simply done our duty. That our obedience is, doesn't impress you. We're, we're doing it because we trust you. You have authority. If we only view God as our loving father, but not our authority, we are in danger of positioning ourselves to pursue our own desires and our own inclinations regardless of what the word says. And if we only view him with authority, we can position ourselves to come to him only in fear, cowering before him, maybe even self-condemning in his presence. And neither is healthy. We have to come to him from a position of adoption and authority calling him Abba in intimacy and surrender. That you are God and I am not. So I surrender my position to you. I come to you as a loved, accepted child and a humble servant ready to do your will. So a question we might ask, are there any areas of my life that I am not bringing under the authority of the Father? I think for some, there might be, for all of us, we should ask. That, yeah, we acknowledge, oh, yeah, he's got authority, but I'm gonna hold this little thing over here and just bank on his intimacy and kindness. When he's, he's intimate and kind, because the scripture says it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. To, to come under his authority and say, okay, th this thing I've been holding on to, I'm gonna bring it under your authority. I trust you. The position of our prayers are more significant than the practice of our prayers. So what positions matter in our prayers? Well, the position of adoption. We are loved and accepted children of the Father, Abba Father. Position of authority. That, that we are humble servants ready to do your will. That he is God and we are not. And we acknowledge that. The third position and last one is this, a position of association. position of association. Maybe I'm late to the game on this one, a little slow on the uptake, so forgive me if I am. I've never claimed to be the sharpest tool in the shed. You've experienced some of that already. Um, but this was such a challenging revelation for me, what I'm about to share. It was convicting, to be honest. I came across it a little over a year ago as I was reading a book on prayer 
and the author talked about what we're about to talk about here, that the model of prayer Jesus gave starts with the word, our. Our Father. And while he is a personal God, intimately so, Jesus told us to start our prayers from a position of association with others. We are not told to pray, my Father, even though he is my Heavenly Father, but our Father. In the Benson Commentary, he said this, being made his children, we are here directed to call him our Father, to put us in mind that we are all brethren, and that we ought to love one another with pure hearts, fervently praying not only for ourselves, but for others, and especially for our brethren in Christ, that God may give them likewise the blessings requested in this divine prayer. Praying our Father reminds me that I'm just a very small part of the greater family of God. That this world does not revolve around me and my needs. It's not about me. That there are others around the world coming to the same Abba, receiving the same love and mercy and grace under the same authority as I am, lifting up their prayers and requests and desires to him, exchanging wishes with Abba Father. But more than that, like that was enough, but more than that, this was so challenging and so convicting for me. It it cut me to the core when this was revealed through what I was reading. That inside of the greater family of God, Like inside the family of God, those who put their faith in God through Jesus throughout my whole life, and it will happen until the end of my life, there are people inside of the greater family of God whom I disagree with and people who disagree with me. There are people who have hurt me and people whom I have hurt. There are people that I'm praying God will change, and there are people praying that God will change me. And we are all together coming to the same Abba Father asking for different things under the same authority. And I think Jesus was wise in starting the prayer, not with my, but our, to remind thick-headed people like me that even in your prayers, it's not about you, Jeff. First of all, it's about me. But it's also about everyone else around the world who may be so different than you, it irks you to no end. But I love them too. And they're calling to me too. He's not my father. I mean, he is, but he's not just my father, as if I have some unique access to him that others don't. Or that he'll do for me things differently because I'm, he's my father. Like, you, you can't go to my earthly dad and just call him dad and have him respond the way he does to me. My dad has three kids. We each have immediate access to him whenever we want, and he does things for us he doesn't do for anybody else. And you can try to go to my dad that way. I'd love to watch. It'd be super awkward and weird. But our Heavenly Father, like all of us, go to him. And we all have instant access through Jesus. And he responds to us in the same way. Our Father. It really is a humbling thing when you think about it. So every morning before I do anything else, I start my day with the Lord's Prayer. But I don't just pray it like word for word. I've been doing this for years now. I kind of develop my own prayer to start the day. It kind of sets the tone for my day. And I just pray it section by section, adding some of my own words. Before I do anything, before I sit down and open the word to spend time with Jesus, before I ever check my phone, which I try to put off as long as possible, I start my day every day with the Lord's Prayer. 
And the first thing I say, as soon as I'm like out of bed and starting to move around and getting the coffee going, and I just pray this as I'm gonna get him set, I start off with this. Our Father, who art in heaven, you are God and I am not. So I surrender my position to you. I come to you as a loved and accepted son, a humble servant ready to do your will, and a very small part of your body, the church. And sometimes I just hold my hands out. Sometimes I gotta pray this prayer multiple times throughout the day. It's not about me. God, I, I, I wanna surrender. I come to you as a, a, in adoption, but also in authority and in association with those around me. So I'll just ask you to quiet your heart for a moment. If you need to kind of close your eyes to find a space with you and God, I just want to ask these questions. Are there, are there any lies you're believing about God or yourself that are keeping you from him? And again, you might need help navigating those, and I would encourage that. Is there anything I'm not bringing under the authority of the Father? And if there is, you might need to do some work with the Lord on that. Maybe even repent of some things and seek his forgiveness. And then lastly, does my heart need to expand in understanding the greater family of God that I'm a part of? Does my heart need to un expand in understanding the greater family of God? maybe it's time for you to become a part of the family of God. You've never put your faith in God through Jesus, and if you want to talk to somebody about that, you can talk with me. Any of our staff or volunteers, they'll make sure and at least point you to somebody who is prepared for that conversation. As soon as I'm done, we'll have a prayer team to my right, to your left. They are all equipped and ready to talk with anyone about what it means to put your faith in Jesus who died for your sins so that you can be a part of the adopted family also, if you have prayer needs of any kind, our prayer team would love to pray for you, and they'll be right over here as soon as I'm done. Father, thank you for four words, our Father in heaven, that really set the tone for everywhere we're going in the series, that we come to you from a position of adoption. We are, we are yours. We belong to you. A position of authority that you're God and we're not and a position of association, that we belong. We are a very small part of the greater family of God around the globe, lifting up their wishes, their desires to Abba, Father. We love you. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Next week, we're going to do the next few words. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. I love you guys. Have a great week. We'll see you.